Well, shipping companies scrambling for a plan B after a container ship struck a Baltimore bridge on Tuesday, blocking the only route to one of the busiest ports in the country. Flexport, a freight forwarder that coordinates shipping logistics for companies, had some cargo on that fateful container ship to break down what the collapse means for supply lines. Ryan Peterson, who's the Flexport founder and CEO, is here. Ryan, thanks so much for taking the time. We know it's an extremely busy time for you, for the team, anybody who's coordinating efforts around recovery recovery right now. What is the first thought that went through your head? What are you navigating right now at this instant? Yeah. Hey, great. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Um, obviously, the first thought is about, about the rescue workers that are out there and the, some of the lives that were lost and, and really the heroic action to save people. We're, we're working overtime right now on behalf of our customers to figure out what to do about their cargo. We have a uh, few containers that are on the ship, just two actually. Both of them are exports for flexport.org that are headed to Africa. So for nonprofit organizations. So working with those customers to let them know, you know, they're probably not going to get that cargo back for the next few months. Uh, we had 44 containers on the Ever Given. If you remember that ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal a few years ago, those 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 customers didn't get their cargo for almost a year as it sat in sort of litigation limbo with the insurance companies. And um, so working on contingency plans with those customers. We also have 800 contain more than 800 containers bound for Baltimore, the port of Baltimore right now. Um, and we're working with the ocean carriers to figure out where those are going to get dropped off. We think most of them will be unloaded in Norfolk, Virginia, and will then need to get trucked or railed to their final destination. So a lot of extra coordination that goes into that uh, in terms of arranging, arranging those trucking services, customs clearances, et cetera. So it's kind of a scramble to, to work on behalf of the customers right now is the, is the main thing that's happening across the shipping industry, really. Ryan, what does the ability look like when you take into account the ports here in New York, New Jersey, down south in Virginia, the ability to take on even more cargo volume? What does that look like? And as you're trying to navigate this very uh, uncertain environment right now, what does that then longer term, do you think, supply, dis uh, dis supply disruption potentially look like here, given the fact that this port has been suspended indefinitely? Yeah, well, there, it'll depend on how long this lasts. Um, you know, there, it's going to take many years probably to rebuild that bridge, several years. I wouldn't want to speak to that. But I, I, I suspect they'll be able to open the channel and allow the port to reconnect with the global ocean in, the, you know, in a matter of weeks or months. Uh, the salvage companies that are they get in there, they, they kind of work miracles from my perspective. So I suspect they'll be able to to start moving some of that uh, rubble out of the way and, and get the channel reopened. Um, the, the ports are it, probably in an okay position on the East Coast. What's happened this year, because we've had so much disruption to the shipping, to sh main trade lanes, uh, starting with the Red Sea, the uh, with the missiles that have been hitting these ships in the Red Sea, well, that's the primary route by which container ships move from Asia to the East Coast of the United States. And that's been disrupted they're going around the Cape of Good Hope. It takes a lot longer. Uh, we also have a disruption, a congestion at the Panama Canal, where it's only operating at about two thirds of its capacity. And that's the secondary route by which container ships arrive on the East Coast. So a lot of volume has already shifted from the East Coast to the West Coast as a result of those two factors. And then there's a third one that's coming up in September 31st of this year, the ILA, that's the labor union that operates the ports on the East Coast their union contract expires on September 31st of this year. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about whether there will be slowdowns or even a strike at the end of the year. And that has a lot of companies worried about shipping to the East Coast and have started to kind of proactively shift volumes where they can to the West Coast and then say, hey, we'll just bring it across the country by rail or by truck, which costs more, but avoid some of that uncertainty. So I think this Baltimore situation is just gonna compound that. It's gonna cause more companies to shift to the West Coast, it does cost more, but it's faster and more reliable. Um, and so because of that, there is probably enough capacity in Norfolk and New York and, and even in Philadelphia to pick up the slack from Baltimore. But I don't know, it's it's a lot of volume to move overnight. And um, hopefully those ports are you know ready to staff up and have the union workers and the, and the trucks and everything else that goes into it to meet the demand. We've seen during COVID in, 2021 and 2022, where you had all that congestion on the West Coast that an increase of 10 or 20% of container volume can kind of cause the entire system to come to grind to a halt. And so we're, we're hoping that we're able to handle this capacity and keep the cargo flowing.
Ryan, all these things accounted for redirection that you're talking about, labor disputes and negotiations that could be coming forward as well. What type of cost are you anticipating uh, could be increased in terms of the comparison to the existing expense profile that you have? Yeah, I mean, it's really a complex adaptive system. It's hard to pin down, um, especially this this soon after an incident like this to, to get a to get a hard number on things. Um, but you can you can rule of thumb, you know, ballpark things is that, well, it, it costs almost twice as much to truck something across the country from Asia, from the West Coast to the East Coast as it does to ship it from China to the West Coast. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's it, it, it can be a big increase in cost. It'll depend on how much volume we see shifted to the West Coast, how much the impact that is. But, um, you know, a, a high price of shipping flows directly into the cost of goods that people pay every day. We saw during the pandemic when prices surged, you know, the price of ocean freight went up about 10 times in the spot market if you didn't have a long term contract. Um, that that was leading in our economist estimate to about three percent impact on goods inflation, three percent increase in the prices that we all pay for the for goods that that are imported, um, which is you know a huge percentage of our of the goods that we consume. So I wouldn't expect anywhere near that level of inflation impact, but it 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 could be you know if you uh, certainly a half a percent or something like that if this lasts and if it you know if the industry isn't able to handle the surging volumes and we start to get congestion and and delays. Ryan Peterson, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us here in Yahoo Finance this morning, founder and CEO of Flexport. Thanks so much.